in, um, in, in the definitions of black poetry, the one that, Car that Carolyn wrote and the one that they recommended, the uh, uh, Stephen Henderson, one of the key things is music. Um, and music, is ha music has held us together. Uh, and it's music in the church, music in right. Saturday night, music, music has held us together. Um, and this next man can tell you about real root music, the blues. Sterling Plump is internationally recognized as America's blues poet. He's the author of 10 books of poetry, including Blues, The Story Always Untold, Portable Soul, Half Black, Half Blacker, Horn Man, which is celebrating the music of saxophonist Vaughn Freeman, and Velvet Bebop Kentacloth, which honors along the way 75-year-old saxophonist Fred Henderson and his velvet lawn, lounge down on the south side in Kerm, uh, Cermak. The collection, The Mojo Hand Calls I Must Go, won the 1983 Carl Sandburg Award for Poetry. The winner of the Broadside Press First Publication Award, he, he edited Somehow We Survive, which is an anthology of South African writing. And he is the author of the groundbreaking analysis of black psychology, Black Rituals. Reg Gibbons has written, Plump's melodies are his amazing utterances filled with metaphor and originality of expression. His harmonies are ideas and feelings, history and consciousness, and his many ways of paying homage to the heroism of making meaning and dignity and music out of a hard daily life. The seriousness and beauty of Plump's work are as unmistakable as the sublime and innumerable artistic feats of the masters of bebop. His poems, reviews, and essays have appeared in Triquarterly, ACM, another Chicago magazine, Epoch, Black American Literary Forum, and, and many, forum and many journals. Plump is a professor emeritus at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where he served on the faculty of the African American Studies and English Departments. When you walk into a bar or a club with Sterling, all the musicians know him. And half the people at the bar are former students who are very grateful. <laughs> we did that. Come on, Sterling. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ed. It's a privilege uh, to be at Northwestern University, to be invited. Uh, many years ago, when I was desperately struggling for anything, Tri-Quarterly was kind enough to publish a number of my poems. And I hope that's not why Regina gave up the editorship of the magazine. <laughs> I come uh, to the Black Arts Movement from a slightly different uh, perspective. The, the crisis that I had been in in 1967 was not directly a black crisis. Uh, it was a spiritual crisis. I was in the United States Army, 64 and 65, and really agonized over whether or not I would have gone to Vietnam to fight if I was sent there. I was not. And unlike what's going on in the world today, I was convinced in 1964 that had they had an election without guns that Ho Chi Minh would have been president of Vietnam. I, I was absolutely convinced. You know, this, this, this rhetoric, Ho Chi Minh was an, a, a national hero. Uh, he would have been president and they were killing all of, of these people and so, so, so I bring that crisis and I come uh, to Obasi from being an activist marching to 
get more black supervisors at the United States Post Office in Chicago, marching to get black residents in South Shore, and marching to Cicero, Illinois, to protest the killing of a black boy. In fact, uh, I wrote a poem based on that march called Black Hands, and sometime in 1967, Don Lee took me to Negro Digest where I met Hort Fuller and gave him the poem. And he subsequently published the poem and began um, my publishing career. The, the, the black arts movement in Chicago, I mean, there are a number of great individuals who are literary. But I thought the one individual that had the intelligence to know what to do with the literary movement was Hart Fuller. So, so there, was no, there was no doubt in uh, my mind. He had the toughness. He had the insight, uh, you know, uh, about who was writing about African American literature. And one of the people who reaped the full blast of his criticism was Robert Bone and his critique of the black novel. I mean, I mean, he, he would go on in hours. Uh, not only that, he is the one individual that had a first-rate library. I mean, like all uh, the books in print by black authors, I mean, they were, they were in his home, and I can remember going and, 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 and taking books down. I'm, I'm, I'm furthermore indebted to him because had it not been for Haki Mabuti and Hort Fuller, I never would have become a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. You know, I never had any intentions of becoming an academic. You know, I, I always thought, uh, despite Shakespeare, you don't change the world with a pen, you change it with political action. <laughs> I always felt that, and it's deep in my soul now. So, so I was always an activist, and Haki Mabute told me that he was leaving to go to Cornell. And if I went, I would get the job. And Hort Fuller is the one who wrote the initial letter for the appointment. And more importantly, uh, if people who are professors know what I'm saying, after you have gone through the process, someone gets you copies of the letters of people who wrote for you. <laughs> you know, uh, and, it, and I'm quite sure that Hort Fuller was the reason why uh, I got tenured at the University of Illinois. I could tell by the names of the individuals and read uh, the connection. I think Angela has done a great job of capturing the spirit of change at the personal level uh, that occurred in African American people. Uh, and I think it's good at any time uh, to proclaim your freedom. Uh, you cannot ever get freedom as a result uh, of legislation. You know, you get a proclamation there. You don't get free. You know, you, 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 you always have to take freedom. You know, and, and I think that that was the, the, the spirit. I, I would like to speak a, a moment about something else that occurred that's very difficult uh, to talk about. Uh, you know, we are together, we are black, you know, we are brothers. And all of a sudden, uh, because I was very close to Kara Petsko Cecile, the South African writer, Dennis Brutus, the South African writer, Mangane Sorote, who is probably more important than either one of them, uh, the South African writer. Uh, from about 1972 throughout the 80s, uh, several things. Dennis Brutus, sent me the names of all of the South Africans who were banned. He sent me the copies of books 
by the prominent South African poet James Matthews, Cry Rage. Jane Matthews, that is, Black Voices Shout. Hurry up to it by Sipusa Pamela. Pimville Station, Sipua Pamela. Sounds of a Kaha drum. Oswald Limchali, he sent me these books. Uh, when South Africans gathered and formed organizations inside of the country, because remember that the ANC and the PAC had been banned. Beginning about 1968, they formed something called the Black Renaissance Convention. And from that came a series of what they call black community programs. Then in the 70s, the South African Student Organization began to expose a form of nationalism that was to wipe out the difference between colored and, Af and, South and African in the country. You know, you know, and he would send me documents like that. And all of this culminates in about 1974, there's a major international conference of African writers at the University of Texas. Wole Shoyuk is there. Chinwa Chebi, Kofi Awuno, you name them. And that's when you, you know, you, you know, we, you know, I'm a, I'm a South African writer, and so I'm there, you know, being glad to be there as an educated Negro. <laughs> and bam, these leftists. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't, you know, I never ask people their political persuasion, right? It was these leftists from South Africa told Dennis that he had to rearrange the whole conference. Number one, you got two million Europeans speaking about our work. You know, they come, they listen, and when we finish talking, that's the end of the discussion. Number two, you have these events poetry reading held on the campus of the University of Texas. Uh, uh, and we didn't come here to read for these people here. You had to put this in the black community. And Dennis, I mean, I love Dennis. He's a friend of mine. He hemmed and hawed, and they told him it was not a request. <laughs> no, 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 you changed. So, so you began to understand. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm a black nationalist, right? No, no, they were Marxists. They were very, very dialectical. I mean, very dialectical. Now, I say this to try to set up <laughs> how being a writer in the black arts movement, you can be drawn into these debates. And I was drawn into it by Dennis Brutus, Muhammad Ali, was offered a contract to fight in South Africa. It never hit the papers. And apparently, he or his manager did not turn it down. <coughs> Dennis Bruden, who was a very brilliant man, personally organized people all over the world to destroy him if he did not turn it down. He called writers at night. He invented an organization called Black Concern. Black writers, Rosa Guy, Louise Merriweather, John Henry Clark was on it. And then they called Muhammad again, and he turned it down. Now, I would say one other thing about this dialectical, I mean, I'm a writer because I'm a black writer and I'm an American. <laughs> At some point, I got asked to do an anthology of poetry on South Africa, and I declined. And Dennis Brutus told me I did not have to decline. Number one, Anything you want to know about South African poetry, I'll tell you. 
any of the authors that you could not contact, you publish their poetry and I vouch for you. You know, so, so, so some, you know, the, the book was called Somehow We Survive. But that was another issue. When I took the issue to black people in Chicago, I asked for a picture of Nelson Mandela, and someone gave me a picture of Nelson Mandela. You know, it's when he was a boxer. And number two, it was the question of the cover. And in order to deal with the question of the cover, the artist was a member of ANC. And so I had to go to New York and speak with the ANC representative to the United Nations. And then I spoke to Du Milley, and then we met with the artist. Now, here's where ideology comes in, and it should be stated. The ANC, I showed them the anthology, and they said, you did a superb job, Brother Plump, but. And I stopped them. I told them that this is a very peculiar kind of anthology. And they said, what is it? I said, it only has one editor. And I was dealing with a brilliant woman. She said, Brother Plop, you edit the anthology the way you see fit. However, when the anthology comes out and you do a fundraiser for the ANC, we reserve the right to invite or uninvite anyone. And I will give you the two names. We had invited a lot of writers. And prominent on the names was Jane Cortez and Amiri Baraka. <laughs> And sure enough, they call us in and say they aren't invited. And we said, why? They said they have spoken against our organization publicly, so they aren't invited. And, 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 and that was the end of that. Now, see, this goes against everything I know. I'm black, you know what I mean? Uh, Amiri had read, he had supported me. He had, published my poetry in his magazine. He had done a blurb for my book. The other thing that I want to say, it, it happened some four or five years later, Lusaka, Swiss, Lusaka, Zambia, maybe it's where the ANC was headquartered, and I got a call that they were sponsoring something called a Mantler tour. And this writer was coming through. And they said, well, you set up a committee and have this person speak at different places. I took the position that I would only set up speaking engagements in the African American community. And we did that. Then about a week before this man comes, I get this phone call and saying that he could not read at Third World Press. You know, and I knew the person, you know, I had worked with him before, and I said, why? And they said that the people in the support movement have said this and this. I explained to her that Haki had problems with the left, but he had never had problem with the ANC. And at some point, we get a call from Lusaka saying that he could speak. And the final thing I'm gonna say about the writing and the spirit of the Black Ops Movement, again, it co concerns Haki Mabuti. There was a writer, I will not give you his name, but I will give it to Ed if he wants to put it into the record. I got a call one night and saying that he was near death. They say it's a matter of hours before he died. And said, can you contact Haki? I'm, I'm showing you how to duplicity this before. 
I said, yes, I can contact Haki. They said, will you tell Haki that so-and-so is near death? Uh, he needs to be admitted for certain kinds of treatment tomorrow morning. Ask Haki, will he help? And I called Haki, and Haki told me it was a done deal. And I called him back. The next morning, this particular individual arrived at the treatment center, and I think Haki put fifteen or twenty thousand dollars on his credit card to save the man. Mind you, it's from some of the same people that said he couldn't; they, they didn't want to speak there. You know, so so that the the, the spirit of the Black Arts movement, uh, the brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, was something that was uh, lasting. I will say one thing about Obasi. Normally, I don't talk about writer skill. You know, I leave that up to time. <laughs> you know, but I will say this, and I will go on record as saying, between 1968 and 1978, I never believe that any female or male poet was any more crafted or gifted than Carolyn Rogers. That is a fact. That is a, I mean, that, that is an absolute fact. I don't, I cannot give out rewards because I don't have rewards to give out. But I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm talking about in terms of paper soul, in terms of, of songs of a blackbird, in terms of how I got over, I think that is written as real as anything that I saw. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, I thought that she achieved a voice, you know, from point one to point B that there was a real distinction. I think that other writers of distinction emerged, but they either had the achievement before they came, but they did not achieve it at the time. I mean, that, 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 was, the, that was my sense of, of what was going on. And my only two regrets about the whole experience had nothing to do with the people there. I wish that we had taking gender on, head on. And so I'm gonna tell you one incident about it. I was in the Congress of African People with Haki. In 1972, we had a party for Amiri Baraka at my home. And he arrived at the party at my home with 12 symbols <laughs> of bodyguard and his wife about 15 paces behind him. <laughs> That's true. I, I mean, I, I thought that we should have taken that on. The other issue, maybe we should have taken on the whole question of sexual choice and, and, and gender choice. See, see, I was hurt. I'm, 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 I'm coming right down and say what, only one thing hurt me about the movement. Only one thing, and Sam might be embarrassed, one thing hit me about the movement. Uh, once I was called to a meeting, and I said, I cannot go. I'm a professor, and I'm trying to. They said, come, and I went to the meeting, and I thought that I was in the Gulag Archipelago because they said Sam Greenlee is on trial. I'm going to tell you what they said to me. They said that he is on trial. And, 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 you know, and I, I, I did a double test. He's on trial for what? They said a brother's wife is white, and we're going to try him and put him out. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, 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 these things go down. And I said, well, what, why are you putting him out? They said he's sleeping white. And I came back with I didn't know how they were sleeping. <laughs> I mean, no, no, it, 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 was a, it was a very acrimonious 
and brilliant moment. And, 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 the, and the, the tragedy was that Sam Greenlee spent more time in the black community reading poetry and bars than the rest of the poets. He was right in the black community, no one who lived on either side of him was having any problem with that. You, you know what I mean? He's living in the black community um, near 63rd. So I thought that ideologically, if I could go back in the past, I would pull some of those issues uh, on uh, the, the table. Finally, the, the, the story of, of the ideological shifts in people of the Black Arts Movement should be studied. A number of prominent artists became communists. Some with the CP, some pro-China. And almost all of the South African writers come from the left background when you get to know them. They were almost all uh, going to the Soviet Union. They, 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 they were, the, 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 the fact of the matter is, uh, I, I shouldn't say it publicly, they were so far to the left that maybe Mandela was not their first choice for leader. They were way to the left in terms of the people, you know. And Dennis Brutus at Northwestern uh, has an incredible collection of papers here. Somewhere there's a writer by the name of Arthur Norkey, Dead Roots, Lonely Against the Light. And you can go back and sort of reconstruct uh, how this information seeps down because the information of Dennis Brutus would never go to the African American community and confront anyone ideologically. That was not his style. That was not his style. But uh, he would give you detailed information on uh, the situation in South Africa. He was in prison with De Nelson Mandela. He was in prison 12 times. He was shot in the back and left for dead on the streets of Johannesburg for trying to run away. Looking at that and, and maybe interviewing some of the writers like Dennis Brutus, uh, Mangane Sorote is a minister of culture in South Africa, Costa Sile is somewhere. Interviewing those writers gives it broadens the kind of insight uh, 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 that we have. Uh, the prominent African-American poets, with the exception of Amira Baraka, did not announce that they were Marxists. You know, although there are some, like Alice Walker, who was very close to Cuba, who would go to Cuba. Thank you very much.